as you're finding your seats, I'm going to just begin. I'm going to start this message time with some information about our, uh, our potential build. This is the structure that we're looking at, given the growth that we're seeing, the overall structure. The bottom part is the existing structure we're in right now, and the top part would be what we would potentially build. There's a closer look at what we would potentially build. And uh, that would be a total of 8.7 million in cost. The operation costs for that are projected to be some, something around $60,000 per year. We do have a phase two, uh, that's plan, uh, a, a two-phase option, I should say, I should say it that way, where we wouldn't just do it all at once. If we were to break it up and just do the sanctuary, the estimated cost of that is $6.4 million. And the operating cost of that structure would be somewhere around $35,000 per year. Those are questions that came up during our Q&A times throughout the last several months and wanted to make sure we hit on those. I'm going to just get right to the point with what we're, we're going to do as far as a vote. But I do want to say, if you have any questions or concerns, those that have been that have come our way so far have been so good and so welcome. Not everybody agrees on what we should do, but it's good to hear from everyone, and I want to encourage that to continue to happen. This is a general idea of what we're planning on building, uh, either one of these phases that we decide to go with, but it's flexible, so ongoing input is so welcome, and we appreciate that from the house. We will have a vote from the ACF voting membership, and that is a state requirement that we have a voting membership and that we have a constitution, and in our constitution it says for any undertaking like this, building in addition, we would go ahead and have a vote. And so I want to say that, that's what we're following is the law. Romans 13 and other places tell us to honor the law if, if we can before the Lord righteously honor the law, and that's what we're doing. But I firmly want to underscore and affirm that the body of Christ is his living brothers, his living sons and daughters, our brothers and sisters, regardless of what we have as a, a voting membership title or not. The body of Christ is his body. He is the head. Everyone here that calls Jesus Lord and calls this their church is a part of this local body. And if you're not calling this your church, but you still call Jesus your Lord, you're part of the body extended, the body at large, the body of Christ. And he is the head, amen? amen. That vote will take place the 11th of February. The question is, should we build an addition, yes or no, or you can abstain as a voting member? I want to read this statement just to be clear, make sure I don't forget anything. If we build... We plan to do it without a bank loan. Uh, let me continue, if you would. We will look to raise a total of $1.7 million before we break ground. And that's if we build. Communications on giving will follow the vote pending the outcome of the vote. I want to thank the numerous people that have contributed their thoughts, concerns, and questions thus far. Your input will continue to be welcomed following the vote as the conceptual design will require further fine-tuning. And that is if we move forward with building. If you have any questions or concerns regarding the vote, the design, anything, please do not hesitate to approach any of your elders, your trustees, and or deacons. These are wonderful men and women of God, and they have answers that they are willing to share. And if they don't have the answer, they'll discuss it with the rest of us, and we'll get you an answer. I want to say unequivocally that you are free, free indeed in Jesus, to vote whatever way you feel led to vote. And we will take it seriously. Whether it's a yes or a no or an abstention, we will take it seriously. That said, 
you'll notice a pink form. The ballots for voting members are available on the way out. Deanna will have those available for you. You just have to sign your name so that we can keep track of the voting members that have picked up ballots. For everyone here, including voting members, also non-voting members, we're doing a referendum poll, if you will. And that's the pink sheet that's also available as you exit the building today or later on in the week if you want to just get it at the office or next weekend, whenever is convenient for you. The reason we're doing a referendum is because over two-thirds of this congregation right now is comprised of non-voting members. It is a significant portion of this living body of Christ, non-voting members. And so we want to gauge those that may not be a voting member but are still committed and want what God wants to happen in this particular local church. We want to engage you and we want to understand where you're coming from. It would be something to have a voting membership vote for the building, but the majority of our congregation right now say no. We would take that seriously, and we would have to pray that through. Um, I don't think that will happen, but it may, and we're going to have to follow the Holy Spirit if it does. It's important to us for everyone to have a specific say and a clear say whether or not we should build. And so that's what the referendum poll is. So just to be clear, those who are members should pick up two ballots today, if you can, or later on in the week, or in the following week, whenever you are able, a, a yellow one and a pink one. Those that are non-voting members should just pick up the pink one, and you can put those in the giving box, or I think there's a, a slot out in the foyer that you can, give, you can put that in. Uh, but wherever you decide to drop that off would be great. The... Uh, just, just, just to make sure I'm crystal clear as best I can be, uh, should we build an addition is on the referen re referendum poll. Uh, bef but please put your name on that. We, it won't count unless you have your name on it uh, because, uh, and again, you can say no. It's, it's really okay. You could say yes. We're, it's, we're just trying to follow the Lord. It's as simple as that. But please put your name on it so we don't have anything counted twice. And like I said, the question on the referendum, should we build an addition? Followed by, how would you support? How would you support? Obviously, if you say no, you're going to say no. I'm not going to support. And that's fine. It really is. But prayerfully, ministerially, and uh, with finances. For those that um, may be gung-ho about building a is it a question that's, okay, go ahead, Ellen. Good question. She just, Ellen just asked something that I was very unclear about ministerially. <laughs> what do I mean by that on the referendum? Thank you, sister. I appreciate that. She's an editor. She keeps me on my toes in a very good way. I bless her. I love you. Um, so, <laughs> for instance, if we are, whether or not we build, but certainly if we build, we're looking for volunteers to help out with ministries. We are behind the scenes right now working on ways to communicate our volunteer needs. We've come up with a list that will be communicated forthwith at some point. But how, how, how do we actually engage volunteers? How do we invite? We're working on that, and some more information will be coming. But it's really important. Um, if, if, you're, if you're here for any length of time, you'll know we're growing. Uh, we've, we've passed the 300 mark. We're probably around the 350 mark. Praise God. <laughs> and people gather together in his name, and he's lifted up. And it's anticipated that we'll grow further. We need volunteers for that. Things like kids' church, nursery. If you're good with a music instrument and you feel God is leading you to help out with worship, those kinds of things. I'll be able to give you, or one of, some of our trustees, I think, are working more on it. At least I'm delegating to them to work on that because I just don't have all the time to do that. But we'll be releasing some more volunteer opportunities. But that's what it means by ministry, if you're able to help, help out with ministries. Thank you for the question, Ellen. Um, just some pictures I wanted to show by way of an illustration the buildings to the left and upper left-hand corner 
are European cathedrals that have grass growing through the sanctuary floor, ceilings open, and no windows, comparatively spending millions of dollars on a physical structure that is now vacant. The buildings on the right, lower corner, and the upper right-hand corner are more modern buildings that look rather attractive, that are completely empty. These were structures that some local churches invested in, and now the churches are completely empty. It is significant when, the, Paul, through the Pauline epistles, Jesus himself says he will build his church, but the body is referred to as people coming together in his name. It is not a building. If you are someone here that is gung-ho about building, yes, let's do it. I want to check you just a little bit. Make sure it's the Spirit of God that's leading you, not just the eye candy of a new structure. Or the physical pleasure, however you want to phrase the, the niceties of a new structure. Make sure it's God who's leading you because history is full, contemporary and through the past, of church buildings that are now empty. That church in the upper right-hand corner used to lift up the name of Jesus. It is now a Buddhist monastery. So let that rest. If you're someone here today, I want to just show you this picture, and you're, you're just so gung-ho against, against building. I want to check that a little bit, okay? Again, you're free to vote the way you want to, but make sure it's the Spirit of God leading you. One way or another, we are a growing church, and we need volunteers, as I just described. If you're one that's going to vote no, I want to encourage you to specifically help us open up our Saturday evening services. We're not feeling led to mandate people come to one service or the other, but if you're going to vote no, I'm going to ask you to pray in the Spirit to be willing to help out with a possible nursery startup, to help out with a kids' church startup, to maybe help out with worship. Our volunteers work pretty hard. If you're going to vote yes, we're going to grow between now and the time that we go into the new building, if we pass the building. I want to encourage you to volunteer as well. Just follow the Spirit of the Lord. This is not a manipulation tactic, but it is some truth that I feel the Lord wants me to share. He says, be willing to serve. Thank you, Lord, that you do call us your sons and daughters, and we do serve you diligently by your grace, Holy Spirit. I want to remind the house that this is a picture of our vision. You may look around you and see the problems in this land, but I want to assure you that Jesus sees a promised land, a land that the Hebrew culture in the Old Testament describes as flowing with milk and honey. In other words, in modern day vernacular, a land filled with blessing. It is the very reason Jesus taught us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, because he has heaven's intention for this earth and for this people that he's created. And so right now, Father, we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done to this earth, that we're called to influence as it is in heaven. In name of Jesus, amen. That's some 17,000 square miles that we're called prophetically to influence. With us at the epicenter, a 75-mile 75 75 radius completely surrounding us. I've never showed you this before, but I wanted to. That yellow box right in the center with the little offshoot and the white box below it represent two townships within Jefferson County. The town of Brownville to the north and the town of Hounsfield to the south. We, right on the river, are in the very center of these two townships. 
the population of the town of Brownville is 5,800 people, according to a census a couple years old now. The population of the town of Hounsfield is 3,300 people. This is approximately a 100 square foot area, far smaller than the area at large that we're called to influence. It doesn't include the towns of Lyme, the towns of Henderson, Pamelia, Adams, Clayton, Cape Vincent, all these other townships that we have represented in our body. The point I want to make is that just in the two townships that we're a part of right here, we have about 10,000 people. It is far too small to expect God to just say that a thousand people should gather in this house of worship. That would only be one-tenth of the people just in these two townships. And that's only a small fraction of the amount of influence that we're supposed to have, that God has called us to have. I want to encourage us not to think fancifully in our flesh, but to think greatly and with expectancy of the great things that God wants to do. He wants to enlarge our faith, expand our capacities to dream in truth, to dream in faith. He wants to persuade our hearts of the substance and evidence. That's what faith is, the substance and evidence of what he wants to do in this land. In the name of Jesus, our mission is to live In the light of Jesus Christ, revealing God's love, transforming lives, restoring true hope. Praise God. If you'll give me a few more minutes, I want to focus on that first descriptor. Our mission is to live in the light of Jesus Christ, the first descriptor, revealing God's love. How many know that that's how God defines himself through his apostle John? 1 John 4, 8, God is love. It's a big deal. And I'm convinced that my love needs to grow, your love needs to grow, and as it does, great things are going to happen. He's wanting his love to be on display because the world is void of it and desperately needs it. There's a God-shaped hole in every single heart that does, not know God, that does not know him, and it's called love, his love. In John chapters 13 through 17, five chapters out of 21 chapters of John, a quarter of the gospel of John is spent in a few hours of time where Jesus is addressing his disciples the evening before he's crucified. In verse 34 of John chapter 13, we read his words to his disciples directly, but also to those who follow, as we read later on in his farewell address. He says this, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. He has previously told us, at least in the synoptic gospels, Two simple commandments. Love God with all our heart, soul, all our mind. Luke has it, our strength. And the second being like it, love our neighbors as ourself. But here in his last hours, in his incarnate state, before he's taken by betrayal into custody, before he's murdered on the cross, his last hours... He's not wasting his words, and he's giving a qualifier. He's specifying what his love is. To love like I have commanded you is to do so like I do. As I have loved you, love one another. Verse 35 says, By this all will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another. The type of love that he's talking about is the volitional choice that Jesus made to lay his life down for us. He says symbolically, 
And sometimes literally, as in the case of Peter and many other martyrs throughout history, to take up our cross. There have been some crucifixions throughout the ages. But he's also speaking to us, loving the way that he loves and being willing to lay down our lives for those around us. I want to show you a picture of John Newton. Those of you that may not know, this is your author for the great hymn, Amazing Grace. Written at or about 1797, somewhere in there. 1779, doesn't matter. In reading the accounts of John Newton, slave revolts on board ship. John was a slave ship captain. Slave revolts on board ship were frequent, so John mounted guns and muskets on the deck, aimed them at the slaves' quarters. Slaves were beaten and tortured to keep them quiet. So John writes this hymn, Amazing Grace, and we think, wow, it is amazing grace, how he was changed, how God's love penetrated his heart and he became a, a lover of those that were in slavery instead of a persecutor of those who were in slavery for his own selfish gain. But what you might not know is that the rest of this quote says this, all this was done after he had become a Christian. For about five years after John met the loving Savior Jesus Christ, after he had a profound epiphany of his grace in his heart, for five years he continued to persecute, torture, and murder slaves on ships. For five years, can you say blind spot? You and I don't necessarily have the same blind spot. We would say and look at, at slavery, it's awful. It is. Unanimously, we would all agree. But are there some ways that we're holding our brothers and sisters in bondage that we're blind to? Are there some ways that the love of Jesus is blocked off in our hearts that we're not liberating, that we're not allowing him to love the way he wants to love? Permit me just to give you a few suggestions. And as the Holy Spirit convicts me in you, so be it, Holy Spirit. How about the person that ticks me off? And it's not just the person cutting us off on the highway. And the, the, the words that may escape our mouths in the privacy of the cabin of our car But even if we deceive ourselves and don't let it come out of our mouths, what's brewing in our hearts when that happens? It's just a simple thing, but it's like, come on. Is that not a creation of God? What, gave me the, what gives me the ownership of the road? All the police officers and troopers in the house just said, thank you for saying that, Pastor. <laughs> Drive as a Christian, right? <laughs> Drive with love in your hearts for other people. No, but come on, let's just go a little deeper. When somebody in our house ticks us off, someone in the family of God ticks us off, and we're, we're, just, we don't, we're just distancing, we can't take the conversation, we don't want to go there, whatever that means. I'm, I'm beyond that, I'm over that. That's beneath me, is what you're saying, but it's not, because nothing's beneath Christ. I want to remind you, in the lead up to what he says in verse 34 and 35 of John chapter 13, he's washing the disciples' feet. It's a beautiful picture of the lowliness that Jesus took, the love in his heart for people. He's washing Judas' feet. 
you may feel betrayed in this house. It is awful. It can be tragic. It can be devastating, but it doesn't have to be because the love of Jesus never fails. We come here and we get excited in a good, a good way when a prophetic declaration is made, when somebody gets healed, when a word of knowledge that's pinpoint is released. Praise God for that. But Paul, as he defines the love of Jesus, said that's all to the side if we don't have love the love of Jesus in our hearts. It is a big deal when we're ticked off with somebody that we don't go to them and pursue them. It takes two to tango, and you know what I mean. To tango in the love of Jesus. Amen? Let's redeem that term. <laughs> it takes two to have relationship. There's only so much you can do, and there's only so much that Jesus can do. I want to encourage you to consider the ways that you may not be going as far as Jesus went when he took the nails in his hands and feet, he laid his arms open, and he suffered for us because he loved us. Let me give you a couple more. When I am loving in Jesus, am I loving the person right in front of me that I'm talking to? Pastor Josh has notoriously had an issue. You may not know this, but I'll just share it because it's the loving thing to do in the moment. So much going on. So many things and decisions to make. So many ministry opportunities to decide on. The person right in front of me having a conversation sharing their heart with me, and I'm thinking about what I have to do. Jesus never once overlooked the person in front of him. The woman with the issue of blood didn't even say a word. She just touched the hem of his garment. He stopped the throng of the crowd around him. He stopped, and he attended to her. Zacchaeus is on a sycamore tree looking at his Savior. Doesn't say a word, but Jesus, in sensitivity to the Holy Spirit and the overwhelming love in his heart, he stops and says, Zacchaeus, today I'm going to eat at your house. And salvation comes to his house. Jesus was tested in all ways that we are. He was tempted to overlook the one right in front of him. Try this on for size. When I'm in a conversation and someone's opening their heart to me and all I can think about is what I'm going to say next. I'm engaged in my own selfish projection of what is going on here, what I want to put into the conversation, what I want to communicate, and I'm not listening. Wow. <laughs> That is a continual opener for me. Am, am, I, am I coming across clear? I see some heads nodding. Yeah. Give me just a little more time. I'm going to give you one more. There's a list here, and we might, we might go into this a little bit next week too. How about the one I have wronged? The one that I have offended. Yeah, we need to forgive when we're offended. But how about the time where I offended and I don't think I did anything wrong? I, I, that's your problem. Yeah. You see the love of Jesus in that, right? He offended in perfection. He is a rock that makes man stumble. He is the one that they trip over. It's a righteous offense. You and I, we're getting there. But we're not perfect yet. We need to take a note from our Savior. Lay our lives down for each other. When I have wronged someone, oh, I really don't want to say I'm sorry. I re do I really need to ask for forgiveness? Do, do I really? D yes! 
the only thing that's holding you back is the very thing that God resists. It's called pride. For brothers and sisters, for this to be the house that Jesus prophesies and prays for will be a house that all men see that is in him. For this to be the house, it has to be distinctive of the world. There's no apologies in the world, very few. It's only when you get what you want in this world, when you can climb the corporate ladder. I'll make sure I put a good face on etc etc but in the house of god the living god the love of god needs to flourish it's humility that ushers in the grace of god we are desperately in need of that this is a house that is repeatedly accoladed in my ear every week people come into this house and they don't even know that we have a prophetic declaration over us that we would be a hospital They don't know that. This is a hospital, spirit, soul, and body. The spirit of God moves and people receive healing. People that don't know that come in, you know what? This is like a hospital. I received a healing in my soul. I received a healing in my body. My spirit feels lighter now. Things are going well. Don't hear me rebuking us altogether. We're doing well. But there are some 9,500 people outside of these four walls that need Jesus. And Jesus gives us the prescription how to reach them. To love as he loves us. Amen? Amen. Let me just read to you a little bit more from John chapter 14. Jesus is not wasting his words. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments These are the last hours of Jesus on earth before he's crucified. In 15, verse 12, he says, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you, and let me just pound it home in love and in truth by the unction of the Holy Spirit. He goes on to say in the immediate next verse, verse 13, Greater love has no one than to lay his life down. Let us do it. In the last words of Jesus, again, the last phrasing of his longest prayer on Scripture, John chapter 17, his longest prayer in Scripture, he's closing out his farewell address, and he says, I have made you, Father, I have made you known to them, and will continue to make you known in order that you lo- that, that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. This is the prayer of Jesus that he would be inside us in full. We know in part, we prophesy in part, we're being made into his image. There's more for us to experience in his love. I want to invite you to stand to your feet if you'd like. We're going to take communion. This week I came upon a story of a small startup church that grew prolifically. And in the startup, there were a few people there of diverse Christian backgrounds. Some of them were Catholics, some of them were Greek Orthodox, some of them were Pentecostal, and there was even a Baptist in this dozen or so people that were together. The leader of that church felt led by the Lord to do communion. And so because of that diverse denominational background, He had some different perspectives in this small startup church on what communion actually is. And so when the Pentecostals accidentally spilled the fruit of the vine, there was a Greek Orthodox brother that came over and started wiping it up because he viewed that in his theology as the blood of Christ. 
If you don't know anything about Greek Orthodoxy, it's similar to Catholicism. They take very seriously the elements. They have a high view of communion. I'll go on the record as saying sometimes I've had too low of a view of communion. It's been just a symbol. In my Pentecostal upbringing, it's been just a symbol. But the words of Jesus, he says this is his body. And we can get into the mystery if we want to of whether or not it actually becomes his body. I don't even think we need to go into that doctrine. What we need to be focusing on is this is serious. This is a love demonstration. It's a sacrament similar to water baptism in which we experience the presence of our loving Savior. Some may take too high of a view of communion. Some may take too low of a view of communion. But let's love each other and respect each other. That said, don't dump your juice. There are Catholics among us. There, I'm serious. I'm serious. I'm glad you can laugh about it. Let's be reverent before him. And part of being reverent before him is us loving each other and respecting each other, preferring one another. Jesus, we thank you for your body broken for us. It was a crystal clear demonstration of your love for us. As we partake in remembrance of your body broken, May your love be a revelation in our hearts and souls. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, we thank you. Your words. In the last few hours of your life, this is the new covenant of your blood. It's your life source that we are partaking of in the spirit. And it was your love that led you to spill out your blood. May you awaken our hearts to our blind spots where we've been offended with each other you poured out your blood so that we wouldn't have to carry those offenses anymore. You poured out your blood so that we could have life that is victory over pride, victory over death, victory in this life. And we partake in remembrance of your love in the way that you gave. In Jesus' name. Praise God. I want to release you with this note. There's quite a few denominations that are represented in this house. And it, historically, that's a sign of revival. It really is, throughout the ages. It's a sign of revival. But we will cut that revival off. We will cut it right, under, right out from under itself. We will choke it out if we don't love the way Jesus loves us. We need to do it. I bless you to do it, and I will receive the blessing to do it from you. Amen. If you would like prayer, please come forward.